Good morning and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to our worship celebration on this sacrament of Holy Communion Sunday. All are invited to the Lord's table. A reminder to the board members that the monthly meeting will be held tomorrow evening, Monday, December 6th at 6.30 p.m. Two special announcements. This Christmas Eve, we will be celebrating together at 7 p.m. to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful this is going to be. As the numbers will be limited, I suggest that you register early if you would like to attend on this holiest of nights. Also, we will be having a virtual Christmas fellowship evening on Friday, December 17th at 7 p.m., to which the entire church family are welcome. At that time, the Ladies of Wings will hold their fundraiser draw for three beautiful Christmas baskets, and if you've not already done so, I encourage you to get your name in for a chance to win. Wonderful prize. So tickets are available this morning or on Tuesday, and we thank you for your support. We were sent to hear of the passing of Mark Wendover on Thursday. Her funeral service, officiated by our minister, will be held this Thursday, December the 9th at Giffen Mac Funeral Home, situated Danforth in Maine. Visitation is at 11 a.m., service at 12 p.m., followed by a lunch reception. The committal will be at Pine Hill Cemetery at 2 p.m. So please keep Mark's family in prayer at this sad time. For all other announcements, please refer to the weekly news flash Friday mornings. Thank you. Well, friends, it's good to be together in God's house and to be together by virtue of uh, YouTube and our extended online church family. Let's stand, if you're able, and let's sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. selection is hymn number 159 verses 1 to 4. We'll sing the first four verses, O come all ye faithful. Oh. 
Friends, let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's offer to him our prayers of adoration and praise and confess our sins to Almighty God. Let's pray together. Well, Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, it is always right to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because when he humbled himself to come among us as a man, he fulfilled the plan you formed long ago and opened for us the way to salvation. And now we watch for the day, hoping that the salvation promised us will be ours when Jesus our Lord will one day come again in his glory. And so with all the choirs of angels in heaven, we do proclaim your glory and join in their unending hymns of praise in our worship today. Lord Jesus Christ, your first coming brought great joy to your waiting people. Keep us in faith and hope as we eagerly await your coming again. Amen. Friends, Jesus said you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. But as God has instructed us in these great commandments, and because we have not always lived in their full obedience, let's now confess our sins to God, trusting Christ as our Savior and Lord. Let's pray together our prayer of confession. While we ask, Lord, for the most meaningful Advent season ever, we sadly confess having done so little with so much. Forgive us, Lord, for not bending the knee, for not reading your word, for not searching our hearts, for not facing our sins. Forgive us according to your tender mercies, O God. Grant that when Christmas morning breaks for us this year, we may have a fresh sense of your presence and a renewed resolve to live to the praise of Christ's glory. Amen. Friends, as we hear the ancient prophecies of the coming of God's Messiah, we long for the day when death itself will be swallowed up when every tear will be wiped away as we wait expectantly for Christ's return. We live in the assurance of God's gracious forgiveness. Thanks be to God for his forgiving love. And having been assured of God's forgiveness to us, so may we extend that peace and that love and that forgiveness to one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And, also with you. and would you please extend that peace to one another with a wave or a gesture. <laughs> peace. going to sing a praise medley now. Uh, this is just uh, uh, the ending for our Jewish friends of the season of Hanukkah, and we'll be singing the first praise selection, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is an old Hebrew tune, and we'll be singing it through three times, slowly, and then a little quicker, and then a little quicker after that, three times, and then we'll transition to our prayer, Speak, O Lord as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Uh, join me if you'd stand, please, and let's sing together. King of Kings, number 266.
Good morning, George family. Today's scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 25, verse 1, and then verses 6 to 9. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will play, praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people, for all peoples, a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged <coughs> wines, of rich foods filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shrewd that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said of that, of that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was a kid, I remember looking at the presents appearing under the Christmas tree. Our relatives from Texas would send them in the mail. And of course, there were presents appearing as well under the tree from my parents and a few neighbors. And I would inspect them and hold them up and shake them and try to imagine what was inside those boxes wrapped with all that colorful paper and ribbons. Now, sometimes I had a pretty good idea. I knew what the sound of pieces of a puzzle made when you shook the box in a certain way. And I knew that something soft and scrunchy was probably not a present I was looking forward to. It was probably a sweater or a pair of new socks. But I still remember all those years later how hard it was to wait. To wait what seemed like forever before Christmas morning came around when the wrapping paper could be torn off and I could finally see the gifts revealed that had been put under the tree for me and my younger brother. Now, I don't feel quite the same about waiting to unwrap the gifts on Christmas morning today as I did when I was a kid. But you know, friends, waiting, waiting is still hard work. The title of my message today is Waiting in Hope. But I want to begin by saying again, waiting is hard work. Waiting patiently is something, isn't something people value very much. For example, who writes letters anymore? We have instant messaging on our cell phones and we send emails to each other on computers. We order things online using Amazon and it comes in a couple of days if you use Amazon Prime in less than 24 hours. We eat fast food by dialing up Uber Eats or DoorDash or getting something out of the freezer and popping it in the microwave. We want it fast and we want it now. now there's advantages to speed, of course. I'm not knocking that. I use and do the things I'm mentioning just now. But I think as a culture, we've almost lost our capacity to wait patiently for something. You know, we wait for things all the time. We wait for the bus to arrive. And on the days when the temperature is getting colder outside and the wind starts to blow, every minute outside can feel like a long time. We wait in line at the grocery store. The other day I was waiting in line at Tim Hortons to put in my own coffee order and there was a guy in front of me and he took forever. He was ordering for the whole office 
and he chose, and he waited until he got up there to decide what kind of donuts he was going to get. Well, let me see here. Uh, and he chose about nine different kind of donuts, and I hope oh, thank. Then he started ordering coffee, and he had about four different. Well, it was hard for me to wait. And there are other forms of waiting that are more significant. Teenagers can't wait to grow up. People can't wait to find their partner or to get promoted or move to a better place to live or retire sooner rather than later. We're waiting for our next vacation so we can get away from it all. We wait for our paychecks or our CPP benefits to arrive in the mail or in our bank accounts, which can be nerve wracking if the bills are starting to pile up. We're waiting for a loved one to recover from an illness. We're waiting for our children or our grandchildren to find more peace and happiness in their lives. We're waiting for someone to notice our efforts and speak a few words of appreciation. We're waiting for someone to say they're sorry when they've hurt us. Friends, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Like I said, waiting is hard work. And it was no different for the people in Bible times, I'm sure. I wonder how Mary must have felt in those 40 weeks or so between the time the angel Gabriel first appeared to her until the moment she gave birth to Jesus in that little town of Bethlehem. What did it feel like to nurture and to carry the Messiah? What physical pain, what, what spiritual peace did Mary experience in those many days? When she received the news of her unexpected pregnancy, Luke tells us that Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Those nine months must have obviously been life-changing, but I imagine waiting was hard work for Mary too. Throughout our lives, we go through periods of waiting. They aren't usually marked by something extraordinary as giving birth to a child, let alone the Messiah of the world, or even marked by a specific framework of time like nine months. But these periods of waiting can be a season of growth. They can be a season of maturing, of becoming wiser and better people. Waiting can be a good thing if we're open to it, or better said, if we're open to God. We Christians have a whole season where we focus on waiting, and it's called Advent. The season of Advent is four weeks long. We're in the middle of it. This is the second Sunday of Advent today, and Advent is a time for believers to prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior, God's gift of love that came at Christmas long ago. And also, Advent is a reminder for us to wait with hopeful anticipation for the time when Christ will come again in power and glory at the close of the age, his second coming. So the season of Advent gives us space and time to slow down, to smell the coffee, to appreciate life moment by moment. It's meant to help us learn, like Mary, to wait with hope and expectancy for Jesus' birth. And it leads us to look forward to Jesus' return. It gives us the context for all the ways that we wait in our lives so we can learn to wait with more hope and greater patience and quiet confidence. You know, scripture is filled with other stories of people who waited. Waiting seems to be one of the main themes in the Bible. Israel's history began 
by waiting on a promise for God to fulfill. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation as numerous as the stars in the sky. But it wasn't until years later when Abraham and his wife Sarah were past the age of childbearing that this promise even began to be fulfilled. When Sarah received the news, scripture says, remember, what did she do? She laughed in disbelief. And the messenger replied, is anything too hard for the Lord? And she went on to give birth to Isaac, a Hebrew word whose name means son of laughter. Years later, Abraham's descendants grew into the nation of Israel, but rather than living in freedom, they found themselves under the yoke of slavery in Egypt. And for 400 years, they waited as they cried out to God for, to rescue them. And God heard their cries, and raised up a leader, Moses, to stand against Pharaoh and finally lead them to the promised land. But Israel's waiting didn't end there. Once they had arrived in the promised land, they waited for a king to lead them. Then they waited for the temple to be built and then rebuilt. They waited to return from exile during war and being displaced by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And ultimately, they waited in hope for a Messiah, a savior to come to save them finally and fully. Prophetic books in the Bible like, like Isaiah or like Revelation describe God bringing into being a new heaven and a new earth. The Gospels describe this as the kingdom of God that we already experience in part right now. But one day, God's kingdom will come in its fullness. But in the meantime, we're waiting. We wait for Jesus to restore justice and wholeness and peace and shalom in our world, to wipe away every tear from our eyes, to make all things new. That's the vision that leads us to pray from the very last chapter in the Bible, the words especially appropriate during Advent, come Lord Jesus. Countless people in the Bible waited for the healing and the forgiveness and the abundant life that Jesus brought to them. In all of these stories, we recognize our own stories of waiting. Like Abraham and Sarah, we often wait with deferred hope. Like Israel, we often wait only to have to wait some more. But we also wait with glimmers of the promise that we will receive. We wait because there's something worth waiting for. And that brings me to the passage that Sharon read for us a few minutes ago and to our communion this morning that we're about to celebrate. The reading is from Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah is speaking God's message at a time of desperation and decline among God's people. They had rebelled against the Lord by following other gods, by breaking God's commands. Oh, they still kept the, up the pretense of faithfulness by offering sacrifices to God in the temple in Jerusalem. The priests kept up their daily routines of worship and saying the right prayers, but the hearts of the people and the rulers and the spiritual leaders weren't in it. Prophets like Isaiah, with increasing intensity, kept saying that when, when people and nations do what's evil, God would judge them. But with a few notable exceptions, the leaders and the people kept right on sinning, oblivious to the impending doom, flagrantly, repeatedly, with the false hope that if they kept up the rituals of religion, God wouldn't abandon them. From the human point of view, they thought their nation was prospering, 
but from God's point of view, it was rotten from within. Foreign powers had already conquered the northern part of the nation. Now only the southern kingdom of Judah was left with its capital in Jerusalem and where the temple was located. And Isaiah warned the people of Judah that their continued sin, their lack of repentance, would bring destruction and doom upon them, but to no avail. And after failing to heed all warnings, in 597 BC, the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar besieged and captured Jerusalem, tore down the temple, and carried off most of God's people into captivity. You know that saying, I've got good news and bad news? You ever heard that? Well, that was the bad news. <laughs> That's the bad news part of the story. Thank goodness there's good news in this sermon. God judged his people because of the evil they did. By abandoning the living God, the people brought judgment on themselves. But the message of Isaiah, the heart of the message of the whole Bible, is not only that God is just, and holy and punishes evil, but even more that God is a God of mercy and salvation. In fact, from eternity past, God has had a plan to save people who believe and trust in him. Indeed, did you know the name Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet literally means God is salvation? God still had compassion for his wayward people and promised to rescue them from both their political and spiritual oppression. He pledged to restore them and lead them home again. After many chapters, the last 24 chapters of Isaiah, the first part of the book, detailing God's judgment against the nations, including his own nation of Israel. Now here in Isaiah chapter 25, we have an amazing word of hope after declaring this devastation that's come onto the nations because of their sin, the atmosphere suddenly changes. There's a strikingly different tone in his words. Oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Wonderful things. What's Isaiah saying here? What, what is he seeing now in, in, in his vision that's making him so full of praise? Isaiah praises God for his power and justice, for being a refuge for the poor and needy, a shelter from the storm. Isaiah describes a wonderful thing that God is about to do to save and deliver his people. And there follows an amazing picture of a banquet a massive, lavish feast with the most bountiful and delicious food being eaten and the best of all wines being served. Listen to the text. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strain clear, the best of the best. It's a picture of a meal like no other, like something given at the coronation of a king or a lavish wedding festival with rich food and the most expensive wine. Friends, I want you to look at that sentence one more time and notice a few details that maybe went past you. Who is this feast for, and when, and where is it going to be held? Well, who's the feast for? It says it's a feast for all peoples, not just for God's people Israel, but for the nations as well, the Gentiles, for people who were outside of God's covenant promises. And when is this feast taking place? Well, Isaiah speaks in the future tense. The Lord will make for all nations. 
I think this is a picture of the end of history, the finale, the final act of God's great drama of salvation. It's a picture of a future gathering of all those who have trusted the Lord from across the face of the earth and have been saved. And where is this feast being held? Well, the text says, on this mountain. Now that phrase, mountain, Isaiah uses a lot to describe Mount Zion, which is another term for the city of Jerusalem itself. But the word Zion is also used in a theological sense in scripture. In the Old Testament, Zion refers figuratively to Israel, to the, the people of God themselves. And in the New Testament, Zion refers to a, a, not a physical kingdom place, but a spiritual kingdom to all of God's redeemed people. As it says in Hebrews 12, we have not come to the mountain, says the apostle, but to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. I think that's the right way to interpret this passage because of what it says next in verses seven and eight. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud, that's a death shroud that you use at a funeral. He will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people. He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Friends, does that ring any bells, those words? Those images Isaiah gives about defeating death and wiping away all tears and removing the disgrace of sin and guilt, all of those words, all of those ideas appear in the last book of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21 as the apostle John is describing his vision of what heaven will be like. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more sin, no more death. Friends, what I'm trying to say is that Isaiah in this prophecy is pointing forward to the end of history, to the coming glorious kingdom of Christ, to heaven, when all evil will be put down when all of God's people from every nation will eat together at a heavenly banquet with Jesus our crucified and risen Lord as the host of the meal, when death will be swallowed up in victory and God will be with his people forever. Friends, the Lord's Supper that we celebrate this morning is a token, it's a, a taste a first fruit, an anticipation of what we have to look forward to that day in heaven. Let me close with a story. David Peterson, a former pastor at the First Presbyterian Church of Spokane, Washington, out in my part of the world where I grew up, told about a time when he was preparing his sermon and his little girl came into the study at home and she said, Daddy, Daddy, can we play? And he answered, oh, honey, I'm awfully sorry, but I'm right in the middle of preparing my sermon. How about in one hour we can play? And the little girl said, okay, Daddy, when you're finished, I'm going to give you a great big hug. And he said, well, thank you very much. And then she went to the door. And, and now these are, these are his words. Then she did a U-turn and came back and gave me a chiropractic bone-breaking hug. <laughs> and David said to her, darling, you said you were going to give me a hug after I finished. And she answered, daddy, I just wanted you to know what you had to look forward to. <laughs> now, friends, that's the meaning of Advent and Christmas, of this supper we're about to eat together. 
is that God wants all of us to know through his first coming in Jesus at Christmas how much we have to look forward to in his second coming when he defeats the power of evil and death and sorrow forever. So may the Lord teach us to wait and to live today joyfully, expectantly, in the hope of his coming. Amen? Amen. We offer our thanks to God as we present our offerings to the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing the doxology. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, hear now the words of the institution of this Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it gave, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the Lord until he comes. So with thanksgiving, let's offer God our grateful praise. Let's sing now as a hymn of invitation number 526. Let's remain, we can remain, yeah, let's stand as we sing.
Friends, if I can direct you in our hymn books to number 564, that gives us the words of the liturgy and the great prayer of thanksgiving that we're about to pray together. 564. And when it comes to our time of saying the Lord's Prayer together, we'll be singing the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, and Karen will lead us on the piano in that, okay? So friends, let us lift up our hearts to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give all thanks and praise. Let's pray together. Gracious God, with joy we praise you, for you've created heaven and earth and made us in your image and kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus our Lord, whose coming opened to us the way of salvation and whose triumphant return we eagerly await. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and the angels and the whole of creation to proclaim the glory of your name and to lift our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. O God of majesty, you are holy. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent him into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior. To bring freedom to the captives of sin. And to establish justice and righteousness for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering. We rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where one day we will sit at table with Christ our host. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O oh God, strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit to bring good news to the poor, to lift blind eyes to sight, to loose the chains that bind, and claim your blessing for all people. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. And we shall feast with all your people in the joy of your kingdom through Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray as we sing together. Our Father,
is a sharing in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share the same loaf. The cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The cup that we drink is our participation in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, for which we give him our praise and our glory. Congregation, the Lord has prepared this table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord, are welcome to come with gladness to this table of the Lord. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. given for you.
blood of Christ shed for you. Friends, let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for feeding us this morning with this sacrament, this token, this reminder of your amazing grace. You've united us to Christ our Savior. You've given us a, a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out now in the power of your Spirit to live and to work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, our final hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 122, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 5, 6, and 7. 1, 5, 6, and 7. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. this week to live holy and joyful lives even as we watch and as we wait for God's new heaven and new earth praying come Lord Jesus now receive the blessing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and upon all those that you love today and forevermore Amen. Um, yeah.